Hi everyone, a quick retrosynthesis of this molecule blastomycin known today. Um, I'm going to address some issues of diastereoselectivity, so the pitch of this video is somewhere towards the later stage of a, an undergraduate degree course in chemistry in organic topics. Please do subscribe to my channel if you like the style of this presentation and I will try to make some more content on the similar lines. Okay then, so as ever with a retrosynthesis, the first thing we should do is identify the functional groups and there's only really two in this one. There's two esters, one in the ring and one not in the ring. So the classic disconnections would be in these positions here. Um, I'm going to take the one at the top first because that separates out my um, my molecule into two bits um, quite straightforwardly, whereas cutting the ring doesn't really simplify my molecule particularly quickly. So that will be my first disconnection and it will take me back to the acid chloride, which is commercially available, and the cyclic uh, little bit at the bottom separated off. Now I could do the second ester disconnection and I will go back to this. So my plan here is that actually there's a few things I could put in as X here. So all I need at the end is to do some sort of cyclization of this oxygen lone pairs. I'd be reasonably happy that that oxygen lone pair could cyclize because that would be forming a five membered ring. So it's a five versus a four membered ring to go backwards. So that should be okay. Um, that X could be anything that can leave really. So we'll just bear that in mind as we go forwards. I find it easier to rotate some of these molecules around when I'm trying to think about stereochemistry. So specifically, I'm going to rotate around here and rotate around here to get me a linear carbon chain. Um, that will give me something like this when I rotate. And then that gives me the relative stereochemistry. So I've got a one, two syn relationship here and a one, two syn relationship here. So we're going to need to address some diastereoselectivity issues when we set those stereocenters. First, I need a general idea of um, what my disconnection is going to be. So uh, another common technique would be to look for the functional group relationship between things here. And I've got my carbonyl group, it's uh, labeled as carbon one, and it's one three related to a hydroxyl group. And that's a, um, a classic disconnection for using aldol type reactions, a so-called one three difunctionalized system. So I'm gonna take my first disconnection as here. That will take me back to the aldehyde and the carbonyl group. So the plan is to enolyze here and fire into the aldehyde. So um, this straight chain uh, substituted um, carbonyl system, that's almost certainly readily available. The aldehyde component maybe looks less obvious, but I'm also pretty happy that this one's available because this looks like it's derived from lactic acid. So it's a chiral pool starting material found in nature that we've got access to for cheap. If we're gonna think about enolate chemistry, so we're gonna to need to deprotonate the carbonyl component here, I will need to put a protecting group on in this position here, and we'll have a think about what that might be in a second. Okay, one thing we can note here is that because this has come from the chiral pool, we have a stereocenter here, and we might be able to use that to um, impart some diastereoselectivity on our reaction. And the reason why we might be thinking about that is that this looks like a good aldehyde for applying the falcon Arn model to. So we just have a quick check. Our, we've got a hydrogen in the middle, that's a small group. The methyl will be a medium type group. And this group can act as the R large. And we know it's gonna act as the R large because it's got an electronegative atom. So it will sit in the perpendicular conformation to make the most reactive conformer of that aldehyde. So under kinetic control, this should be dominant. So we can notice at this point that to some extent, it won't matter too much what we're gonna put as that protecting group because we've got the electronegative oxygen in there. So we just need some sort of default protecting group. So uh, a sensible one might be something like uh, a TES group. Um, by which I mean a silyl ether, so triethyl silyl. That's a reasonably robust silyl ether for this type of purpose. Okay, so we've seen that there's a falcon on preference, and it's in fact the correct falcon on preference um, for just any enolate attacking that aldehyde. So any attack on that aldehyde will set the correct one, two syn stereocenters over here. But the one, two syn relationship across the newly forming carbon carbon bond, we need to think a bit more carefully about. Um, one technique that we could use here is if we 
invoke some sort of cyclic transition state, so using a zinnemann traxler type model, we should be able to get the um, the one to sin relationship that we need um, from a Z enolate. So that's the, the geometry of the enolate we're going to form on our carbonyl component. This is sometimes called the cis enolate as well, just for reference. So I think there are two ways we might be able to get, well, at least two ways of getting a Z enolization working selectively uh, to form the Z enolate. Um, and that's going to depend on what we put in as x. So if I say that x is equal to O methyl, um, as in I'm using the ester like this, we could use um, so-called soft enolization techniques using boron. So um, a standard way of doing this would be to use dibutyl boron triflate in the presence of a bulky amine base, like this diosopropyl ethyl amine. That should form the um, Z enolate for us, so dibutyl boron enolate with an, uh, with an O methyl group there. And this boron uh, is Lewis acidic. It's got a 3p orbital left. So we can use that to set up a cyclic transition state. So that's all good. The other option that we could do um, is to set X as some sort of chiral auxiliary, or even just a big group might work, but a chiral auxiliary will work very well in this situation, as we'll see in a second. So suggestion would be to use some sort of Evans type chemistry. So that's using an auxiliary along this form. So we have a chiral uh, group, so that's our X being a chiral auxiliary there. Uh, if we were to treat this, well, we could even just do this with LDA at minus 78 degrees. It would probably work pretty well. You could use boron if you wanted to. Um, that will help form the, the Z enolate. And one of the things that's help forming, helping to form the Z enolate here um, is the fact that we've got some potential for internal collation here with the lithium. But we can use the lithium itself in the aldol reaction to set the stereochemistry as we want as well. So that's all good. Okay, now that's just addressed going backwards. We've got a plan. We've got a Z enolate. We're expecting there to be some falcon on control. So two options. We could use the um, the Z enolate that's been formed from the boron enolization at the top. So we've got an achiral enolate reacting with a chiral aldehyde. So we're expecting the falcon on model to do all of the work. So we might expect the falcon on model to be about um, six to one dr. So reasonably modest, but not awful. Um, we would then form a separate diastereomer in the reaction and we'd need to column it away, for example. My preferred method would be to go for the auxiliary route, so going via this enolate down the bottom, where we have a both a chiral enolate and a chiral aldehyde. Both the enolate and the aldehyde's facial preferences for reaction are both pointing towards the diastereomer that we want as our product over here. So the enolate is going to control the one to syn relationship across carbons two and three. And the falcon on model could help control the other one to syn relationship. One thing to note here though, is that the Evans auxiliary is a much, much more powerful um, force in, in diastereoselective reactions. So we've got both falcon on model and and Evans auxiliary helping us, the auxiliary will always win. It's always a bigger kinetic effect. But in this particular case, um, both of the factors are working together. So we should expect a really, really high diastereoselectivity if we use the auxiliary controlled reaction. Okay, so just to join the dots, we're saying that we can use some sort of aldol reaction and then I'm going to need to take my TES protecting group off. So maybe I could use um, some sort of aqueous acid would be an option, or we could use a fluoride source, I guess, like TBAF. Okay, rotating this molecule around to give me the reactive conformer. I'm pretty happy that a um, five membered ring will form in preference to a four membered ring. So I need to find a way of cyclizing this. So we've got two options. If we've gone via the X equals O methyl route, um, we'll just have an ester there. So we should be able to get that cyclization to work quite quickly. So if we've got X equals O methyl, we might want to just use catalytic acid here and it should cyclize and expel methanol. So there's an entropy driven component to that. 
if we've used the auxiliary at this point, so that's the chiral auxiliary. Um, it's a bit more sturdy because it's an amide uh, bond that we've got involved there. So we might want to pre-hydrolyze it. So we could use something like lithium peroxide. We tend to not use hydroxide in this case for a reason I'll just come back to. So lithium per peroxide with a, a reductive workup, a mild reductive workup. Or we could use sodium methoxide potentially, although it's a bit more risky. So if some of the things we need to worry about here is that we've put all the effort in to set the stereocenter in this position here, alpha to the carbonyl group. Um, there is an epimerization risk, epimerization risk here. Um, there's also a bit of a risk with this hydroxyl group that there's a um, there's a retroaldol or an E1CB elimination risk. So we have to be a little bit careful getting that auxiliary off. So if we use the um, peroxide method, the peroxide anion, it's a bit more um, mild as a nucleophile and we get good selectivity for cleaving auxiliaries with that methoxide. Well, we'd need to do it at low temperature probably and, and wait a bit to, to hydrolyze it back to the ester and then we can cyclize round with the acid catalyst in, in, in either method. Okay, and then the very final step would just be to get the acid chloride and we've got one of the hydroxyl groups is still free and we can just use some pyridine to help us with that esterification reaction which just goes under normal esterification mechanisms. Okay, that's me done for now. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel and I'll try and find some more topics in chemistry that I can talk about in a casual way in the future.